Hello, good evening, and welcome to today, today's session at the Bangalore International Center. Pain bites, it need not be painful. This session will trace the evolution of pain and its perception, and joining us are Senthil K. Vijayan, who is a pain medicine specialist, joining us from the UK. And we have anesthesiologist uh, Niranjan Jayashila, who's joining us from here in Bangalore. The full bios of our speakers will be shared via the chat box. And do post your questions in the Q&A box, which is next to the chat box. With that, over to you, Dr. Santil and Dr. Niranjan. Thank you. Thank you, Raghu. Good evening, all. Uh, good afternoon from London, probably. I'd like to start by thanking BAC for this opportunity and Ravi. And above all, thank you for all the esteemed audience joining in today. If not for you, I won't be doing this talk. So thank you once again for sparing your Sunday evening to be with us. Thank you. But, uh, pain, it always kind of rings a negative tone and a negative feeling to everybody. But as the topic clearly says, pain need not be so painful. I'm a big fan of uh, James Bond, so you will see a lot of James Bonds popping in and out of the screen every now and then. Uh, this is, I'm sure you all would have seen and heard of Sean Connery. So I'm a big fan of James Bond, and you'll be seeing a lot of uh, Bond picks coming in and out of my talk. And this is the very first uh, movie, I'm sure many of you would have been aware of this, Dr. No uh, by Sean Connery. But uh, there have been a lot of quotes in history and a lot of history behind pain and the way it evolved to where we are now. And this is one of the famous quotes from Julius Caesar who said, it is easier to find men who will volunteer to die than to find those who are willing to endure pain with patience. So I'm sure each and every one of you in the audience today would have experienced some sort of pain in your life or had a close family member or friend who has been exposed to a painful condition what are the reason I might be, and it's not very pleasant. So if you trace back the history of pain, uh, the word actually, pain originates from Greek mythology, from a word called poina, which is the goddess of revenge. So in old Greek culture, when people saw somebody suffering, they couldn't really figure out what was the reason behind their suffering. And they thought that particular person is possessed by Poina, the goddess of revenge. So that's how the word evolved from Poina to being the current word we use, pain. So these are two pictures in this slide. I'm sure you can see them. The one on the left with the skulls with holes in them. These were excavated from the Mayan and Inca culture down in South America around 5000 BC. So as you can clearly see from the, from the skulls, there have been holes drilled into the skull. So the Mayan and Inca people who were quite smart during that time. They thought the pain is in the head. And the treatment was to drill holes in the skull to let the pain out. I think in this stone age, if a pain consultant like me tries to do this kind of treatment, I don't think I will have much uh, fan following. But at least the concept of pain being in the head that is felt in the brain was existent almost 5,000 years ago. It just shows the uh, advanced, how advanced these people were during their times in Maya. Mayan culture. 
And the picture on the right is eel, which you have uh, heard of, which is an electrical fish, which sends small electrical impulses when you touch them. And in those days, the river Nile used to have a lot of eels swimming around. And uh, the priest or the high priest whom we call in Egyptian civilization, who played the role of doctors as well along being with priests, used to treat the pharaohs or the royal family Spain by placing the eel in the part of the body which hurts. Like if you got a low back pain, if you're a pharaoh, of course you can't be suffering in pain. So the treatment was catch hold of the eel and put it on the back, which sends small electrical impulses and which will stop the pain sensation being carried into the brain. This is almost 3000 BC. So that's the same concept which has been evolved in medicine now. Many of you would have heard of, I would have used something called TENS machines, which works exactly on the very same principle, wherein you can stop the pain signals going into the brain through your spinal cord by stimulating other sensations like touch and pressure, what we call the gate theory in the modern medicine. But the concept is exactly the same 3000 years ago, quite fascinating. Hey, the definition of pain is what it is in front of you. Unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. There are a couple of words in this sentence which I want to highlight. We all agree it's unpleasant. It's a sensation and emotional. So it's just not the pain itself is significant, but the emotion which goes along with the pain that is more distressing than the pain itself actually. And you do not need to have any tissue damage or being sliced by a surgical knife surgical. to have pain. But even without tissue damage, you might feel pain, mostly in chronic painful conditions. So as a pain specialist, if I broadly classify pain, they can probably come into two broad, broad terms. One is the cancer pain, the other being the non-cancer pain. This is a very broad classification. And as they are self-explanatory, any pain arising due to cancer or treatments of cancer fall into the cancer pain category, and the remaining all fall into the non-cancer pain, including your whole body pains, your back pain, which is so common in this 21st century, shoulder pains, neck pain, pain going down the legs, they all come under the non-cancer pain category. I'll just touch upon cancer pain because that's something you can relate to or can, you, it could have hit you close to home because cancers become so rampant for many reasons. One being the change in lifestyle, the change in food habits and the stress we go through and the better diagnostic facilities we have kind of picking up cancer quite early on. And the irony is, in most of the times, the treatments for cancer can be more painful than the cancer itself. I've seen a lot of patients who have come to a stage to tell the doctor, I don't want to put up with this treatment anymore because it's so painful, I'd rather live with the cancer. That is not that uncommon. And many would have probably heard of the treatments mainly for cancer is surgery which again can cause pain. Chemotherapy, which will definitely cause pain because the chemotherapy drugs are toxic to the cancer cells, but affect the nerve cells as well, which cause a lot of pain, which many of you have felt yourself or know a close family or friend who had gone through this awful experience. So cancer pain is a totally different ball game compared to the low back pains and shoulder pains and neck pains which needs a totally different approach in handling it. And when I touch upon cancer pain, I have to show this guy whom you are, are very well aware of, uh, the genius of Steve Jobs, I'm a big fan. And he suffered during the last few 
weeks and days of life because of pancreatic cancer, which can be one of the most awful cancers one can experience. And there's a famous quote by Steve Jobs. He said, you know, he's one of the guys who revolutionized the world and he made lots and lots of money. And this one of his very famous quote during the last few days of his life is, you can hire somebody to drive your car for you anywhere. You can essentially hire anyone to do anything for money, but you cannot hire anyone to bear the pain for you. So no matter you are coolie in the roads of MG Road or the great Steve Jobs, pain doesn't differentiate between the rich and poor. What you got to go through, you got to go through. Unfortunately. Fred, another aspect of classifying pain could be acute and chronic. These are two commonly used terminologies in the field of medicine. Acute is anything which is fresh or new. And chronic is anything beyond three to six months. So if you go for a appendix surgery, you got pain after the surgery, that's acute pain, which is not that difficult to manage, it will get better in a day's time. Uh, but unfortunately, chronic pain is a totally different beast altogether. It uh, is more complex in the sense, it tends to affect your psyche, mood, and emotions, which are long-standing effects on the individual and the family as well. So this is another way of classifying pain into acute, which is short-term due to tissue damage, and the chronic pain. On that front, actually, uh, I might touch upon wh why is pain there at all? And uh, I think that you highlighted the point of evolutionary. The purpose of pain is to protect the human body. That's how it's all evolved. Like imagine you are during the caveman times, you're running around hunting for food in the jungle, and then uh, you break your leg running around, trying to save yourself from a saber tooth. And the part of the leg which is broken sends signals to brain and causes a lot of pain so that you will not use the leg and rest the leg. And I'm sure in those times there was no orthopedic surgeon to fix the broken bone and nature took its own course. It will heal on its own within a couple of weeks time, but you got to rest that part of the body. So the human body evolved to develop this pain so that it protects the leg getting into more further damage. That's the whole idea. The protection purpose of pain is how the evolution started. And there's a, if you, any of you are avid, readers in this group, I would strongly recommend a book by Paul Brand. It's called The Gift of Pain. It's an interesting story. This is a guy, a British plastic surgeon who spent most of his time working in a leprosy hospital down near Vellore in Tamil Nadu. In those times, in 50s and 60s, the two biggest killers in India were tuberculosis and leprosy. And leprosy is even more awful because the bacterium affects the nerve cells so that people lose sensations. So the, the disease doesn't cause the fingers to be kind of turned inwards or, or I'm sure you're all seen in movies or in real life, the leper with fingers chopped off it's because they don't feel the pain anymore. They cause more damage, whether it's fire damage or any injuries, and literally they lose their fingers gradually. So the pain is not felt in them, and the purpose of pain, which is protection, is lost, and they cause more damage. So there is a purpose for pain to further, to avoid any further damage. That's how it started. It's protective in nature, and Plasticity, I will touch up on the plasticity in the sites below and, and how the pain is modulated at different levels. 
this is an important slide actually uh, to show it's not the acute pain, how the chronic pain is influenced by so many factors which you will be surprised about, like psychological factors, your spiritual belief, your social, your cultural background. If I take 10 people from the audience today and expose them to painful stimuli, all of them, pretty much the same age group, maybe the same sex as well. Then all 10 people have a totally, totally different pain experience. If all 10 of them break the bone and have a surgery in your hospital fixing the broken bone, all 10 of them have a totally different pain experience. It is fascinating. You think, oh, they are the same age group, same socioeconomic status, and same problem. But why they all 10 have a totally different pain experience? Because it's influenced by the religious belief, spiritual belief, their upbringing, the social strata, and the cultural beliefs. For example, if I give you a picture, there are a lot of studies being done in Europe. Imagine you are a little boy kicking football around in anywhere in Europe, for example, like uh, Italy. These are big footballing nations. And uh, when you are kicking the ball around as a small 10 year old boy, in the streets of Italy and you fall down, the whole street come rushing towards you. Say, oh, are you all right? Are you okay? Are you in pain? And the 10 year old boy thinks, okay, so I should behave like I'm in pain. That's kind of learned behavior. He starts crying and he gets attention and then that's where it is. And if you take the same 10 year old boy playing football in the streets of Germany or Munich somewhere, and when he falls down, uh, everybody just keeps looking at him and uh, he, stands up, dusts himself off, and starts to play again. So that's a huge cultural difference between these two countries. And uh, uh, so you will be surprised how pain is influenced and affected by your beliefs and cultural upbringings and stuff like that. That's clearly proven by many of the studies. And I just thought I'll put a slide about the scale of chronic pain is becoming one of the biggest issues in the Western world, at least as of now, and 40% of adults worldwide report some kind of pain, including back pain, headaches, and arthritis. And at least 10% have been pronounced disabled in the society because of chronic pain. So it can be quite disabling, the whole chronic pain symptoms. Another James Bond. But uh, I won't use much of the medical or technical stuff. I thought I'd just show one slide to demonstrate how pain is carried from the periphery where there's a tissue damage, like when you have a when you cut your finger with a knife while cooking. The pain impulses go to your spinal cord, your backbone. That's where the spinal cord is, and then goes up to the brain. That's how the pain is felt in the brain. But at the same time, there is something called descending modulation. So pain is not like a very rigid aspect. It's got a lot of plasticity. That means it can self-regulate itself. It can decide. The brain can decide what pain is more important and what pain is not that important by sending some signals down from the brain, the green lines, what you can see coming down from the brain to the spinal cord and to that particular part of the body to decide at this point of time, this pain is not important to me. And that's why in, uh, I don't know, Indian mythology or Hindu mythology, if you go back, you could see sadhus and sannyasis walking through fire and uh, sitting on a, well, bed of nail lying on that. I've seen them growing up in Chennai when I was small. And because, if you can regulate and control your mind, you don't need me. You don't need pain doctors. You don't need any doctors, actually. The brain has got immense potential to do whatever you want to do. The thing is, to harness its potential is not easy. It takes great amount of discipline. And if you are most of that, then you don't need this lecture at all. You can be giving lectures on how to modulate pain. I'll give you an example. 
And there have been a lot of instances where I still remember there's a big rugby match between England and Wales. I think England and Scotland in Twickenham in London. And uh, it, it was a couple of years ago. I fell mass and one of the big players for England kept running. And then he was tackled and he fell down. And uh, the driver, the Adelian West, kept pushing him to keep going and then score the goal. Uh, and when he went back to his room, changing and having fun, all this things, and they found his ankle looked out of shape. And then when he had an X-ray done, he had a kind of both bones fracture in the lower part of the leg, what we call the tibia and fibula around the ankle. And they were surprised with this damage, you could hardly stand how were you able to run and score the goal at the try, what we call in rugby. And it baffled doctors. Like, and as soon as he saw the X-ray, the player himself started rolling in pain. That's what the brain can do, the adrenaline rush, the passion for the playing for the country to go and score the try. His brain took control and decided, okay, this pain at this point of time is not important for me. I will suppress it for a couple of more minutes so that I will achieve what I need to achieve. It's a simple so if you go back again, cave man days, when you're hunting in the forest uh, with a bow and arrow, and you're being chased by a saber-toothed tiger, you start running, running for your life, or else the tiger is going to kill you. And while running so far towards the cave, if you run upon a thorn, you're not going to stop there and take the thorn out of your foot because it's hurting, because you'll be the uh, dinner for the saber-toothed tiger. So the brain at that point of time decides, hang on, boss, that pain is not important. Keep running for your life. You keep running, you enter the curve, and then you are kind of secure and safe in the cave. And then you look at your foot and it's bleeding. And he said, oh my God, and start crying in agonizing pain. But during that point of time, the pain was deemed unimportant by brain. And it releases some kind of chemicals called endorphins. Some people have heard of that. They are like naturally occurring, very strong opioids like morphine. And that can suppress the pain for a few minutes till your life is safe and secure in the cave. You run away from the separate tiger. So the pain can be modulated at many levels, depending on the status. But again, the research which shows when your psyche or mood is affected by depression, anxiety, this old defense mechanism is lost. That makes the pain even more worse. And uh, another big James Bond, a big fan of Roger Moore of the Shan Canary. That if you manage to skip through my talk till now, at least this is for your eyes only from now onwards. Uh, I'm sure you, most of you are from various uh, backgrounds. I was told by Ravi, who uh, has got their own respective fields. And IT is something which we can't run away from. I'm sure you all are used a lot of IT hardware during the times, and now we have a whole lot of computer-related medical issues. That's a big, big industry in itself, and it's going to get even more worse. The carpal tunnel syndrome, which is a pain in the wrist due to repetitive stress injury, using the mouse and stuff, and musculoskeletal problems. The human body is not geared up or developed to sit in a chair and work on a computer for 12 hours a day. That's not the way the body has evolved itself. And is struggling to cope with that. That's why you've got these back problems, shoulder problems, neck problems, and of course, staring at the screen all the time, leading to eye problems as well. So we got to find ways of coping this. And then I'll talk about two main pain issues which are not that uncommon in this talk today. One is called fibromyalgia, and that means the pain coming from the muscles. Uh, and this is a well-known issue, actually. We are trying to understand more and more of this, and it's more common in women, uh, and it's within the age group of 30 to 40, but I've seen really young people in their 20s and 25s having this fibromyalgia, which can be a widespread muscle pain with fatigue and various tender points in various group of the muscles in the body. It's getting more and more common, and it's driven by stress. I've seen a couple of young woman presenting to me, uh, working for 
some high profile jobs and just couldn't cope with the stress. And one of the manifestations is like pain all over the body. And of course, another common symptom with these guys are poor sleep. We underestimate the power of sleep. Sleep is paramount. If you are in chronic pain, you're not going to sleep well and sleep deprivation makes you into a totally different animal. Uh, and these guys have a lot of cognitive issues as well. What the terminology is called, fibro fog. They tend to be very absent-minded, can't remember things for too long. They feel their head is always in the cloud. That's a very common symptom. I'm sure you would have come across this through your maybe your daughters or friends' daughters or why not sons as well. It's becoming more and more common with the younger generation of people because they are not very well equipped with coping stress at this point of time. He's a, a born man, U.S. Bosnian. Right. I thought I would just touch upon low back pain, uh, which is probably, I'm sure you have a lot of questions about low back pain today in the Q&A. Uh, low back pain has got multitude of causes. It's just not one thing that can cause pain that needed to low back pain. It can be non-specific from the muscles, from the skin, from the bones, from the discs, from the ligaments and whatnot. Your back is one of the most complex structures in the body. And it's just a picture to show your back with the vertebral bodies, which are the bones you feel in your back and the discs, which are like a cushion in between them and the yellow bits are the nerves which come out, which supply your leg. And whenever there's a disc bulge, that will irritate the nerve and pain, cause pain down the legs. You might have experienced this yourself or would have some family members who would have experienced this called the radiculopathy, for which you would have probably seen a spine surgeon or a pain specialist like me. This is one of the most commonest of the chronic pain issues we come across in our day to day practice. It's again, another structure which shows a lot of structures which can cause pain, right? From the bones to the ligaments to the discs and the nerves, cause leading on to low back pain. Now, this is one of the pictures to show like the posture we take while working on the computers for too long a time. And they, over the period of time, the thing is, your body is more forgiving when you're in your 20s and 30s because your muscles are strong no matter what kind of posture you kind of hold on for a long time the body will try to cope with that but the damage what you do in 20s and 30s starts showing up in your 40s and gets worse when you're 50. so sitting on a computer for a long time slouching leaning forward this is what most of the IT guys do if you do a snapshot audit as we speak now is bad for you and as I said, in your 20s and 30s, you'll get away. It will come back to haunt you badly in your 40s and 50s and probably worse in 60s as well. So try to adopt a physical posture, which is opt, which can be driven by ergonomic specialist or the occupational therapist in your particular company who will highlight the issues of poor posture. So what should we do? I always tell all my patients, the best way to treat chronic pain is avoid it. If you can avoid pain, well and good. But what can we do to avoid it? And it's very simple. Less stress, more activity. So try not to sit for a long time, walk around. I'm sure a lot of IT companies are getting very mindful of this. They organize uh, stand-up meetings. Where they have meetings standing up rather than sitting down. And uh, walking rounds, we do a lot in hospitals where we go around doing rounds rather than sitting in one chamber and discussing about patients. So we try to keep ourselves physically act as active as possible. I'm sure it's slipping down to the society, but again, we're still not that great in keeping ourselves physically active compared to the Western world. So. I thought I'll just give you another example of what you can do in your office desk or while working on a desk in the BAC or having a meeting or something like that. So there are simple, simple stretches which you can do to strengthen your back muscles, your leg muscles. This is all available 
uh, free of cost on the internet. So if you can do some repetitions, just by stretching your hamstrings and the leg muscles and the back muscles, you're going to be kind of pushing back pain away and trying not to spend all your money on doctors like me. I think we come to the conclusion. Uh, the whole essence of this talk was to get awareness about chronic pain, not to be too technical or too medical. Uh, and as I always close all my talks, it's important to know what sort of person has pain rather than what sort of pain a person has. Because pain is influenced by the person who has the pain. As I said, if you take 10 different people with different personalities and expose them to the same pain supply, stimuli, all the time would have a totally different response. So I always tell all my students or my colleagues, do not treat the pain, treat the person. This is only take home message. Tell all your doctor's friends, all your children who want to be doctors, that the message is treat the person slash the patient, not the pain alone. Thank you for listening. Hello, um, good evening all. Um, I can't match my brilliant colleague who is a veteran in presentations. Um, I'll do my best. Um, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's a privilege talking to this August gathering of great achievers. Um, thanks to Dr. Saraswati, Mr. Ravi, and the rest of the organizing members. Um, I just want to talk about a few things, uh, mainly acute pain, um, which is, and also the role of anesthetists in managing both acute and chronic pain. Um, somehow, in India, um, traditionally, historically, uh, the pain, especially the post-operative pain, is managed by surgeons, uh, whereas in most developed countries, um, it's managed by anesthetists. And we only get involved um, if the pain is complex or it can't be managed by simple painkillers. And we do things like nerve blocks, wherein we put local anesthetics to the nerve roots, um, supplying that area where the pain is originating. We also do things like epidurals, which is wherein, wherein we leave a small plastic tube in your back and we can infuse local anesthetic medications um, for sometimes days. We also do what's called patient-controlled analgesia, where the patient has a button to press. He can control, um, he can get extra pain relief as and when required. Um, you get stronger painkillers like morphine, fentanyl, and things like that. Of course, it's all done in a controlled and safe environment, uh, not to end up overdosing or uh, causing harm or side effects. Um, as Sintil rightly mentioned, that pain is subjective. Um, everybody has different threshold and each individual's pain requirements are variable. So we have to um, give the, the right drug to the right patient at the right dose, which is very, very important. There's also something called preemptive analgesia, which is when you know you are undergoing a surgery, you know you will have pain after the operation. So there's no point not taking painkillers or waiting for the pain to manifest and then take painkillers. So you start taking pain early, be proactive, not reactive. So you take painkillers on the previous night or on the morning of the surgery, and then you carry on taking it for a few days. For example, if you have a small cut and if you have had a suture to that, you may not need much painkillers or you may not even need it for a day or two. Whereas if you undergo a knee replacement, for example, 
you may need painkillers for many weeks or for months. So you may need one regular painkillers or two regular painkillers and a third as and when required. Because if you don't take painkillers, then you are in pain, which affects the various systems of your body. And, and you can't then do much because you're in pain and you don't do much. And then you end up with other problems associated with the operation or the side effects of pain or complications. So please do take painkillers. I know there's a lot of uh, worry regarding the side effects of painkillers. Yes, there are side effects. There are side effects with everything, um, most of the medications we take. But then if we take them at the right dose and the right medication that suits you, then it, when you weigh the risk benefits, you definitely have benefited from taking painkillers. So for example, there are drugs like tramadol, which doesn't suit some at all in terms of they get bad nausea, vomiting, constipation, and things like that. Of course, um, some people have bad reaction to drugs like proof and diclofenac, and um, there are more serious risks like you know, causing kidney damage or gastric ulcer and things like that. Yes, it has to be taken under um, expert advice. And um, if you take them, people take these medications for weeks and months and years, and they don't have any serious complications if it is taken safely. So in terms of uh, the pain is approached as a um, what we call multimodal approach, because I know it's inconvenient to take too many tablets, but at the same time, um, all these tablets, a different group of medications work through different mechanism of action. So it's, it's really important that we use that benefit and take multiple medications um, and don't end up taking one single drug, which doesn't give good pain relief. And you may end up taking too much of, an, of one medicine and then you may end up with overdose or more side effects. So it's better to approach this pain through different medications which work differently. Um, in terms of side effects, I'm sure if you tell a um, lot, of, lot of you to take a glass of beer, which will probably help you with your pain, I don't think many of us will worry about the side effects. Um, so uh, I'm sure uh, uh, we can, uh, please don't worry about side effects. There are, but you just have to take it safely. Um, the other thing I want to touch upon is um, the painkillers, what you take in the hospital are uh, stronger and also they are taken as injections, either intramuscular or intravenous. So, uh, Ideally, you would want to go home. Obviously, you can't take these at home, so you will go home with tablets. So you have to um, manage or get the pain controlled on, on tablets or suppositories. Or We have patches nowadays, um, fentanyl or diclofenac and various painkillers, which can be um, put on your shoulder or back or wherever, where there is a continuous um, a medication going into your body, which prevents the peaks and troughs associated with taking tablets um, or suppositories at regular intervals. So uh, they are beneficial, but then um, we need to take one of these and control the pain before you leave the hospital because you, uh, you take these injections and then suddenly you go home and start taking tablets and realize that you are in severe pain. That's because you haven't um, taken the right dose and you haven't uh, controlled it through these medications, which we don't know how it will work. So, um, so it's, it's better if, if possible to sort it out before you leave the hospital. Um, there is 
another uh, set of patients who, as Sintil was mentioning about patients with chronic pain, whether it is cancer pain or musculoskeletal pain or um, whatever pain you have. So you've been on uh, chronic on these chronic pain medications for weeks or months or years. So when you come for a surgery, please do take these chronic pain medications. Don't stop them because you are getting into a situation of what's called acute on chronic pain. So on top of your regular chronic pain medications, you, you need extra acute pain medications. So which we'll have to start just before the surgery and following the surgery for a few days or weeks, and then gradually we can stop it. Um, and we carry on with our chronic pain medications. So uh, next time you go to a hospital, please don't stop any of the, even if it is acute pain medications you are on, you carry on. Of course, you do inform your doctor about what medications you, you are on, but don't stop them because you are getting other painkillers in the hospital. We may just want to continue the same medications at a slightly higher dose, or we may add other acute pain medications um, on top of this chronic pain medications you are on. Um, I think I don't want to take too much time. Uh, I've just uh, made a few points which I thought was important, relevant, and I'm sure uh, we can go through a lot of these uh, uh, question and answer session. We can clarify the doubts you all have. Thank you. Uh, we have a thank you for that, Dr. Santil and Dr. Niranjan. We, I think uh, we have a lot of questions coming in um, and I'll read out the questions and I think either of you can just, you know, decide to sort of address them or both of you can address them uh, sure. as well. Uh, uh, I think the first question is uh, from Saras uh, Ganapati. Uh, her question is, I feel that many physicians have a moralistic attitude towards pain and its relief, sometimes even in terminal cancer. Would you agree that pain relief needs to be much better handled? Yes. Without any doubt. I always use this quote and I want to thank Saraswati for highlighting this point is very, very significant. Even in this 21st century, we cannot stop people from dying, but we can and we should stop people from dying in pain. That's a basic human right. Nobody should be in pain, definitely. A dying cancer patient, it's no excuse. That means the doctors or the system failed them miserably. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Santil, for that. Um, the next uh, question is uh, from Priya Krishnamurti. Uh, psychological or mind modulation aside, do physical reasons like, say, variation in endorphin release from one person to another explain the dif differing pain thresholds? Then you want to take that? No, carry on. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, as I touched upon, uh, the pain is a very subjective phenomenon and it is influenced your psyche and status of mind. For example, if somebody is complaining of rheumatoid arthritis, it's, which is a type of arthritis, and if they put them in London in the month of December, it's cold, it's wet, it's miserable and dark. The pain is multiplied tenfold. Take the same person and put them in, maybe I don't know, I would say Barbados or probably somewhere in a beach in Bangalore or Goa during the summer months and their pain will be like 
non-existent at all. So a lot of environmental factors play a role and the biggest role is played by your mind, the psyche. And that's probably influenced by the release of endorphins, which are naturally occurring opioids in the body. But again, uh, the age old Greek saying of a sound mind and a sound body. You're not going to have a sound mind unless you have a sound body. And you're not going to have a sound body unless you have a sound mind. So keeping the mind healthy is probably more important than keeping the body healthy. Because if you keep the mind healthy, the body will be taken care of automatically. Uh, this question is from Ila. Uh, CBD is now more and more accepted in some countries as a legitimate option in the assignment of pain treatment. In your opinion, is it safe? Is it safer to use a topical application rather than take it orally? Right, I will answer this question. Uh, by CBD, you mean like uh, for the others, I think it's cannabinoids, uh, which has been legally accepted in many parts of the Western world now. Even in UK, a couple of years ago, there was a regulation of the law, I think in 2018, where doctors are allowed to prescribe cannabinoids, but the research pertaining to chronic pain is still the jury is out there. We are not sure whether people, the addiction is a more of an issue or is it really beneficial? So as of the British Pain Society, latest recommendation, it is not being regularly prescribed for chronic pain conditions because the evidence is not that overwhelming. The main evidence is probably the, the usage in uncontrolled pediatric epileptic conditions. So very few doctors like neurologists can prescribe them, at least in UK where everything is very highly regulated. So the bottom line is the evidence is not very robust in the chronic pain conditions. Uh, this question is from Dr. Gopal uh, Dabade. Uh, in India, a fixed dose combination of paracetamol and brufen is used and many other combinations are used. Is it justifiable? You know, this is a very medical question, but... Well, yeah, no, uh, I think, unfortunately, um, there is a risk involved. Um, people do take, for example, paracetamol separately, and they also end up taking these combinations. So there is this danger of overdosing yourself. So um, as long as the patients are aware or made aware of, you know, what's there in their medications and they're warned not to take them separately, or if they take that, to make sure that, you know, you, for example, you are taking paracetamol and also you're taking a drug with paracetamol and brufen or paracetamol and tramadol combination. You definitely want to make sure that you don't end up taking too much of paracetamol separately or you just take regular paracetamol, the right dose of paracetamol and taking tramadol um, on its own, uh, the right dose of tramadol without paracetamol. So yes, it is unfortunately for a layman unless they're aware of this risk, uh, it can be dangerous. But I think it's difficult to, to bring about the change uh, uh, easily. Um, thank you for that. Uh, this is a question uh, from Srinivas Samuti. Uh, human beings have not developed an objective measure for pain, like we have for many other body functions like temperature, blood pressure, etc. What could be the reason for this area being left to only subjective experience? You know, even now pain is measured using paper and pencil and scaling of a level of pain. Right. That's a very good question. Thank you, Mr. Srinivasamuthi. A pain, as myself and Nirinjan uh, alluded to earlier, is a highly subjective phenomenon. We do not have the objective measurements like, yeah, as you said, temperature and blood pressure monitoring for pain uh, because 
it's influenced by your mind. It's like, how do you measure somebody's happiness scale? How do you measure somebody's sadness scale? We still, yeah, somebody might have a Ferrari and a Lamborghini in Bangalore and still not be happy. And somebody would be going around everywhere in a cycle and be more happy. So these are all very philosophical stuff. And pain is very philosophical as well because it's to do with your mind. So it's, I mean, there's a lot of research going on everywhere in the world. And uh, I'll be a millionaire if I come up with the adaptive tool for measuring pain, because it's very hard to disprove somebody that you're not in pain. Because if, if, if you, as Mr. Srinivas Muthi comes and tells me, doctor, I'm not diabetic. And if you're lying through your teeth, I can do a finger fingerprint and check your blood sugar and it's, if it's uh, in UK scales, if it's probably uh, 14 or 15, then it's proven that you're diabetic, your blood sugar is high. But if you come to me and, and start rolling around in pain and say, doctor, my tummy hurts so bad, I'm, I can't bear with it anymore. And my pain score is 10 out of 10. There is no way for me to disprove that you're not in pain. Yeah, that's what we are at this point of time maybe in future but it's going to be very tricky uh, the next question is from Anjana Aji um, she says that experience of pain differs due to patients personalities people's personalities uh, is there any way to increase one's pain threshold you know strategies answer? Well, I think um, we've been, Sintil has been uh, stressing upon this pain, how it is subjective and how various factors influence pain. So I think it's, it's, it's very difficult. Of course, there are a lot of non-pharmacological means, but then that's what it's all uh, in your mind. So by just going for a walk, cycling or being on a beach, if if you if your pain is reduced, then obviously you don't need painkillers. But at the same time, um, obviously even if you go there, nothing might change for some. They may still need every analgesic available. So I think um, yes, uh, we don't know what works for you, but you can try. Um, there are various things available from meditation to uh, exercise to uh, to what not non-pharmacological means from acupuncture and um, cryo and all that stuff so um, you can try all those uh, things um, if, if that works it's great but otherwise unfortunately um, I'm sure even the medications may not work but it's definitely worth trying and especially if you don't tolerate painkillers very well, or if you end up uh, with side effects from these painkillers in the long run. I mean, I want to add some more points on that, Raghu. Uh, our question was, how do I increase my pain threshold? Right? Uh, yeah. I'll try to keep it very simple and say, eat well, sleep well, and be happy. And surround yourself with a lot of positivity and happy people. You will stay away from me. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Santil and uh, Dr. Niranjan. I think that's uh, more or less the questions that we had from our audiences. Uh, it's indeed comforting to know and acknowledge our pain. Thank you for sharing these relevant insights and giving us a few pegs to know that pain is manageable. And thank you, audiences, for joining us this Sunday evening. Thank you, Raghu and uh, Leka. Well done. Thank you. <laughs>